and we're live. It is Tuesday, uh, May 26th, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. You know, Boris Johnson, uh, his top aide said to the BBC, quote, I don't regret what I did, said Dominic Cummings, by which he means getting in a car and driving 260 miles to hang with his family during the COVID-19 lockdown that the government that he served imposed. But that's okay, because you know when you're in power, you never have to say you're sorry. Uh, we're not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we have John Barrett and his beard. His beard will not be here for much longer, but it will be taking your questions today John Q. Barrett, welcome to In Lieu of Fun. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Kate. Good to see both of you. Great to see you. I have commented a few times to Ben that, oh, well, actually, I think I mentioned this already in the show, but I think that seeing both of you is like one of my very, was like my final activity, uh, social activity out in the wild before. <laughs> I, that was a live Friday night that uh, actually was dangerous in hindsight, but I as far as I know, everyone is healthy. I don't know of anyone getting sick after that. Ben? Yeah, I, I want to say that our book party, Susan and my book party in New York at the house of the estimable, the right honorable Molly Jong Fast, uh, uh, which was not socially distanced, uh, is not known to have involved any transmission of the coronavirus between any person and any other person. It was a delightful affair. And it was, as Kate says, many of our last social outing because relatively shortly thereafter, things went into lockdown, social events stopped happening. So this was the last time I saw either of you other than on Zoom. But John Barrett has a distinction among guests on this show. He has many of them. Um, but I think with the exception of Danielle Citrin is the only one who has a completely independent relationship with Kate and with me that like, you know, I did not uh, like Kate did not meet John through me nor I the other way. And I, they actually occupy totally different parts of my brain. That's and a good yet, point. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really great point. Sorry to mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, and, and it's not even quite true of Danielle, because I think in a, in a meaningful way, I met you through Danielle Citron. Um, so like you could say that our relationship is derivative of that. But John, like we have completely different relationships, but, but that is like a tangent in our lives. That's right. I, in fact, your knowledge of Kate Klonick was a relatively recent development and kind of surprised me. And then I thought, of course, and then Kate and I were talking and I mentioned that you once wrote for the Washington Post and she said he did. And so <laughs> you kind of have these two separate pieces that become connected. It's a wonderful thing. So I love that, that there's somebody, uh, you know, for many years after I left the Post, I assumed that my obituary would read Benjamin Wittes, a former Washington Post editorial writer, died today at age 93. Uh, you know, he was controversial because of the following three editorials that he wrote on judicial nominations, right? Saving like, his I thought, family from a sinking battleship. Exactly, I was gonna like forever be a former Washington Post editorial writer. And so it is actually somewhat gratifying that uh, somebody like Kate would not even know that I used to write editorials for the Washington Post. It, it did strike me too. Uh, you know, you got decades and decades before the obituary, but there may be a generational thing you here. You never know, it may be but tomorrow. That's not, but, like, but Ben, that's not how I met you. Cause I met right. you. I think it's the work. I think yeah, I met yeah. you for like all of the work that you were doing on the issues that I was doing. I met you at that round table at Stanford. That was like a tremendous, one of the best round tables that I've been a part of. It was just like a really I wanna, good- I just, I just wanna say that like, this is a meeting of super high power people at Stanford University that Jack Oldsmith and I convened. And every time 
Kate opens her mouth, everybody, it's like those old Smith Barney commercials or E.J. Hutton, which John is, will remember where, you know, people say, well, my broker is E.J. Hutton and the whole room quiets and l- listens. And E.F. E. Uh, Hutton. E.F. E. Hutton, right. And the slogan was when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. And that was my introduction to Kate Klonick because like um, we go to this like high power event at, at Stanford and she's like pretty young. And every time she opens her mouth, everybody shuts up and it's like stops typing on their computers, which is what we actually do during conferences. And it's like, okay, this person knows a shitload about this subject, which was of course content moderation. And, um, and uh, so we were all like everybody there, like who hadn't previously heard of Kate Klonick has not forgotten the name since. Oh, well, let me just saying. bump her up one, <laughs> one more notch uh, because I have the advantage of getting to sit in faculty meetings with her. In which I text oh, you under the table. Literally <laughs> next to her. And, and, right, and so, you know, her kicks garner attention, but when she speaks, uh, you know, she's that kind of force on, you know, governance of the law school, student issues, property law, curriculum, hiring, you know, the soup to nuts stuff. And so, who uh, would have thought no that surprise. somebody who has so much to say and so like, uh, I know this is not a word you're supposed to use as praise for anybody, but uh, who is so articulate and thoughtful, can't get the slogan of in lieu of fun right on a routine <laughs> Who would have predicted really can't. that? Uh, it's impossible. <laughs> I try to do it every day. <laughs> like it's but, very hard. I, do, but, but I should I write thing. it down? I feel like it wouldn't no, be. No, 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 no. I wrote you it down. I should try it. to remember what? it. Kate, watching you struggle with it every day is one of the joys of my life. <laughs> um, um, but um, in all seriousness, um, uh, John, welcome. And so I think because we have these entirely different uh, valences of who you are and what you do, I think we should do this as uh, like telling, telling the stories of two entirely different relationships and talk to you about your stuff in the context of those relationships. So Fire away. Fire away. I will, I will start. We met because for two reasons. Uh, one is it was the late 90s and you were, uh, or the mid 90s, you were working uh, in, the, uh, in the office of the Inspector General of the Justice Department, which has recently had some uh, prominence because of um, uh, the uh, Carter Page FISA and Crossfire Hurricane reports and some other matters. Um, but you were also uh, then an aspiring academic with an interesting uh, interest, which was the independent, the history of the independent counsel law and special counsel investigations. Um, and you were, uh, and that led you to uh, somewhat surprisingly, to being the biographer of Robert Jackson, the great attorney general and justice and Nuremberg prosecutor. Um, And so I want to start, I know the answer to this question, but I think it's a fascinating story of academic crawling from issue to not related, but with a point of tangency issue. Tell the story of how you go from being uh, a investigator at the office of the of, of the office of an independent counsel to being an academic authority on the independent counsel law to being the biographer of Robert Jackson, who had nothing to do with independent counsels. Well, well, yes and no on the last part, and I'll I'll toss in the word Nuremberg. Well, yeah. later. I was just gonna paragraph. say I was like I was yeah. like wait for wait, but the. <laughs> Am I going to violate um, Godwin's law if I bring up Hitler? (laughs) (laughs) No analogies. This is just actually relevant. Yeah, Um, exactly. So I worked for Lawrence Walsh, who was the Iran-Contra Independent Counsel, from 1988 until 1993. 
Um, and during that time period, at the beginning, the constitutionality of the independent counsel law was being litigated. Uh, various people who were subjects of investigations uh, simultaneously filed federal lawsuits saying the statute is unconstitutional. It violates the appointments clause. It violates the president's unfettered removal power, et cetera. And those cases sort of made their way up to the US Supreme Court. One was against our office uh, brought by Oliver North. One was against independent counsel, Alexia Morrison, brought by the subject of her investigation, Ted Olson. Um, this case that was case, a big, big deal. Yes. You might, yes. people in my generation might know Ted, well, no, was it Ted Olson? I was gonna, didn't yeah. Ted, yeah, people in my generation might know Ted Olson for, I can't remember, which there's a whole bunch of them that have flipped back and forth, like very famous uh, attorney. Yeah, but Ted Olson, Ted Olson is a friend and a great lawyer. But didn't he, didn't um, he, didn't he do the, um, the old Rigefell? Was that Ted Olson? Yes, he did. And yeah, he, also, he already okay. held the Perry case from California. He yeah. was the solicitor general. He did. He did the, uh, he did, he represented George Bush in Bush in, v. Gore. in Bush v. Gore. He's a uh, celebrated conservative he was lawyer. Solicitor General in the Bush and administration. He was, he was SG. His wife was killed on 9 11. Oh, wow. He, I did not know that. Really? Yes. Um, Senior and, partner at Gibbs Dunn and Crutcher, which has been his private sector home for decades when he hasn't been in public service. Sorry, I just uh, mentioned this because like you mentioned Ted Olson and it's like to hear that, it's exactly the question in a way, it's the question that we just touched down with you and with Ben, which is that there is just like these in fascinating circuitous paths that people weave and they all make sense when you kind of put them together. But like, if you like, or like, wait, the guy who did Obergefell was Bush's lawyer? Like that like is, you know. So and, I just wanted to throw and, that out there. And actually the story of Obergefell is, Obergefell is, is a wonderful one. It was, you know, that Ted and Rob Reiner, uh, the uh, uh, the film uh, magnate. Careful. It's, it's the Perry case a year earlier. It's the sorry. California Prop 8 case. You're quite right. Um, uh, they are political opposites, but, but they very much agree on the, uh, on on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, and they like that case was hatched over lunch between the right. two of them, and it's it's and actually then, a very moving story. It's the a New great, Yorker it's profile is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, you guys and read so that? Ted and David Boyce litigate that case together, and the Supreme Court kicks it out on a lack of standing ground, which sort of postpones the merits decision for a year. And then a year later is when Obergefell gets decided. Uh, but anyway, Ted Ted is a superb lawyer and a good guy uh, and a conservative Republican. And those are all consistent things in one sentence uh, and served in the, in the Reagan administration as an assistant attorney general. And it's a long, complicated story, but he was accused by some members of Congress of having withheld information and not having testified truthfully in an oversight of Superfund waste uh, litigation matters. And that was referred for criminal investigation and that triggered the appointment of an independent counsel because we had this statute that had what I would call a hair trigger. It didn't take much to get the attorney general under the statute to be compelled to ask the court to appoint a special prosecutor. And so Alexia Morrison, super lawyer, uh, federal prosecutor, etc., is appointed by the court and she's investigating Olson. And Olson says this whole system of farming prosecutorial power out of the Department of Justice to someone independent violates the Constitution. That's the case that goes up to the Supreme Court. The court decides in spring of 1988 in Morrison versus Olson in favor of Morrison. She wins the case seven to one that the statute is constitutional. The lone dissenter is Justice Scalia and it is one of his classic you know, light everything on fire, dissenting opinions. It is the great, uh, and he was it really is the totally single, in his prime. And he really anybody, cared about this one. Yeah, anybody who hates Justice Scalia needs to read the dissent in Morrison and you can never hate him totally after it because it is this brilliant constellation of, of, the of of law and history and a kind of philosophical seriousness it is a wonderful i mean it's a wonderful wonderful beautiful experience. writing 
I mean, beautiful very writing. emphatic, forceful writing, but beautiful writing. I mean, you can tell that he just cared intensely about this case and he gave it everything he had and he was in his prime. And it is a great, I think still wrong, and I'm in the minority on that. He was in the minority then, but I think still wrong dissenting opinion. But it is a it is the classic and very serious consideration of the issues. In the middle of this dissent, he quotes at some length a speech that the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Jackson, gave in 1940, called the Federal Prosecutor. And it's about the ethical way to be a prosecutor. I would uh, do deep injustice to even paraphrase it. But the idea is prosecutors prosecute crimes. They don't begin with a person and then dig in to see what crimes they can find. Prosecute crimes, not people. And because I was working in an independent counsel's office, because the constitutional issues were connected to ongoing work, I, of course, read this opinion closely and kind of filed away, although it was an overwhelming victory for our side and our constitutionality, the Scalia quotation of Jackson, because it's a brilliant, eloquent dissent, quoting apparently a brilliant, eloquent speech. And I'd already been kind of a Jackson fan, I guess, from law school, from reading his opinions. Ironically, Scalia sat in Jackson's seat. Uh, so there's a nice connective thread. There. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, uh, it's huh. quite a seat. It, it goes from uh, Harlan Fisk Stone to Jackson. What a to weird Harlan, line. To what William a very Rehnquist, weird line. To huh. Antonin Scalia. And today it's Neil Gorsuch. Um, so it's got, you know, a bunch of uh, greats from our past and some people who were intense writers, some people who were brilliant writers. Um, you know, I think every Supreme Court justice is, anyway, um, it's a great seat. Scalia writes this quote of Jackson, his forebearer in the seat from prior to the, his judicial service when he's attorney general. Then I'm working in the Justice Department. And when you walk around that building um, and kind of being in, in the IG's office, I was the counselor to the IG, kind of his lawyer. Um, I was around the building a lot. You see Jackson's portrait in a lot of hallways and conference rooms because he held a lot of jobs as he flew up the ladder in the Justice Department. He ran the tax division, then he ran the antitrust division, then he was solicitor general, then he was attorney general, all in less than five years. Um, and a very senior career lawyer named David Margolis, um, working out of the deputy attorney general's office, kind of was unofficially, officially the liaison point of contact with the IG's office it was somebody I got to know and got sworn at a lot by him. And yeah, he swore a lot, a lot from of me very, too. Very early on, he was handing out photocopies of something. He said, you got to read this. Everybody needs to read this. And it was the Jackson speech from April 1, 1940. Mm. So, you know, kind of ka it reminded me of Scalia's dissent. And then I really read the whole speech for the first time and really thought this was interesting. Um, then I'm a law professor and starting to dig into writing topics. And I figured, okay, this highfalutin abstract speech from April of 1940 must have had a context, a backstory, a history, because it was Jackson assembling the U.S. attorneys from all around the country in Washington and telling them the right way to be a federal prosecutor. So I started to dig into that and I kind of figured out what that was about and got deeper into Jackson and then kind of one thing led to another and it became a career project to write about Jackson. Um, so that's the, the kind of bouncing ball that, that Ben knows that goes from working for Walsh to working on Jackson. So that's, um, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna shift gears and let you, uh, let, let, and, and do the Kate version of this story. But that tracks in a very deep way my professional history, which is of course not about Jackson, but is about, you know, while, while, you know, there was a period of my early career when I was um, spending all my time writing editorials about independent councils and I mean, particularly Ken Starr, but also, you know, the uh, some that are now forgotten uh, including one named Barrett. Um, no relation. Uh, no relation, <laughs> fortunately for you. Um, and one named Smaltz. I mean, this occupied an immense no relation. amount. <laughs> also no relation. You know, this occupied an immense amount of my time um, for a number of years. And then, um, but then the theme of that speech 
is a huge part, and uh, although I in important ways think the speech is wrong on its central thesis, empirically, it is not wrong normatively, but I, I do think that speech is, is formative to my attitude toward the Trump administration and toward the way that I understand what's happening now. Um, and similarly, Justice Jackson's trajectory of being a kind of civil libertarian who sees totalitarianism and gets religion about the need to strengthen democratic authority is I've always found like a very moving, animating feature of my own kind of political trajectory. Um, and so I'm, I'm fascinated by the, one of the reasons I've remembered the story of your intellectual development and in, in your academic interests is that it so tracks my own interests over the same period of time. That's why we're pals, simpatico. <laughs> so what's the Kate version of this story? Oh, it's well, like I, much I, less. Do you want to hear I this? I come first, right? So you, you tell it, but you know, I, I'm the lucky person who gets to see your resume. Oh, yeah. That was, <laughs> so um, I was thinking I would start it with, um, well, one day in September, 2018, Kate was on the job market to try to get a professor job. Um, and the, you know, for those like that are not particularly aware of like legal academia, it has been for a very long time since 2008 or 2009, a very difficult job market. And it was just kind of starting to come back, rumor had it. Um, and um, because the law schools had um, increased numbers of enrollment and all this other kind of stuff and law jobs were coming back. And so 2018 is in the um, job market. And um, for some places like New York where there's a number of law schools and there's one central hiring event, but I was basically asked to come in at St. John's and interview in person. Um, I got off at the Jamaica sub at the Jamaica sub, like Metro North or like LARR. I get in this cab. The cab drops me off at the ass end of campus. That's like probably like half. Thankfully, I like budgeted this never happens again in the rest of my life. 45 minutes of extra time uh, to walk all the way across campus. It's beautiful. It's like this big sprawling campus. I find the law school and like, you know. Um, and I come and I you know, walk into this room and it's like, I think there was like a big hiring committee that year. It was like eight or nine people around the table. And I just had kind of like a lovely chat with all of you for like 30, 30 minutes or 20, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, however long the interviews typically last. Um, and, uh, you were exceedingly, exceedingly nice to me and m my second circuit judge, um, uh, Dick Wesley was just kind of like, uh, John Barrett contacted me about you. He's really excited about your candidacy. Like, blah, blah, he really thinks you're great. I'm like, oh, that's very nice. Who's this guy? Um, so like, anyways, um, and then uh, suffice it to say that I did uh, a lot of kind of reading up on everyone that I interviewed with before I came in for my job talk and all these other things. And um, I was just kind of, uh, the things that I was interested, in, you know, I look back at this and it's kind of silly, but I was really like, like to me, like you were kind of this, you did all of this work of bringing judges like into St. John's to talk to the students and to do these events and to do all this kind of like outreach and to kind of talk to students about stuff. You had the Jackson list, you had those types of things. And so it's interesting, like when you learn about someone by like just reading about them online versus like years of being friends with them, it's like, I just had no idea how far back that you had been like on like doing all this stuff or how it had like all kind of unfolded. I didn't know anything about the independent council stuff until like after I was on faculty, right? Like, right. like meaning you know, you're old, right? John. Because like you have so much writing on Jackson and like you have and you know. Right. And well, and the independent council statute expired and it kind of went away and this special council regulatory successor 
uh, was mostly dormant until the Mueller phase. And, you know, way back in 1994, we're not asking what you were doing, but you weren't tracking Morrison versus Olson or- I was you know, in fourth cetera. grade and I was writing a book report on Susan B. Anthony. And so I just- And it was like, a damn good book report. So one of the things, I mean, Kate's fantastic. It's great to have her as a colleague. The law school hiring market is this incredible festival of riches and you meet these wonderful people. You can't hire them all, but sometimes you're lucky to land uh, one or two of the most uh, coveted candidates. And Kate was that for us in that hiring year. Uh, and I've got to sort of connect you back to Jackson because you're an upstate New York kid. And Robert Jackson from Jamestown, New York was quintessentially upstate. And I've spent a lot of time all across New York State. You know, you're Rochester, where I've been to Susan B. Anthony's grave and uh, all, you know, east to west across New York. Uh, which basically runs from the Atlantic Ocean to Cleveland. Um, and that kind of upstate stuff, which includes Judge Wesley, uh, Second Circuit judge sitting in the center of the state, um, is a part of you that connects with at least an adopted part of me. Yeah, that's such a nice way of putting it. But I also, yeah, it was also like Jackson also had, I mean, he obviously did, he wrote about it, but like had this platonic ideal of like the, is to me the platonic ideal of like the country lawyer, despite all of his highfalutin jobs and these immense like historical landmarks. There is just this, let's hang out a shingle, jack of all trades, generalism about his, like, and, and, and the similar type of, and that was also the way that I knew the law, to be frank, was like actually a lot of like my, like my dad was that country lawyer, but then my mom was this not quite highfalutin, but like a judge and did all these. So those were kind of like, there's a lot that like, I just kind of feel like Jackson is just so relatable and has just, he's just an entire research agenda in and of himself, which is why I was kind of surprised that you had a research agenda before that, because it seems like there's plenty there to work with. So. I want to ask you a really impolitic question about the Jacks, the great Jackson speech. And this is the speech that Scalia quotes. It's the speech that Rod Rosenstein recently quoted. Susan and I quoted it in, a, in our book. It's an orienting point for a lot of people's attitudes toward the justice system. And it's really deep and really profound and really elegantly stated. And the basic idea of it is that there is so much discretion in the hands of the prosecutor because we all commit crimes all the time. And so if you choose, instead of choosing the crime that's most serious that you need to go after, if you choose the person you wanna go after, um, you can get anybody. And so this had a just really deep impact on me. But my question is, is it wrong that, I mean, so on the one hand, yes, it is obviously empirically correct, right? You can choose a person and go after him. But that's what, like, when we think of great cases, the you know prosecution of Al Capone, that's exactly what the Justice yeah. Department did, right? They said, yeah. we got to get Al Capone, what can we get him on? Right. And so my question is, is Jackson stating an ideal that is in fact has nothing to do with the way the Justice Department in fact operates? And in fact, the Justice Department for a long time has said, Al Capone, bad guy, what can we get him on? Okay, tax evasion. Michael Flynn, we know, we know, we don't know what he was up to, but it was something bad. We don't, you know, he'll plead to this false statements thing. Let's get him on that. Um, how much of the Jackson speech is really bullshit? Um, I think some portion of it is, is exaggerated. I'm not sure about bullshit. Uh, because he, you, you got to remember the moment and look at some of his context that's part of the speech. He's talking in 1940 as Hitler's conquered Europe, as the Blitz is about to begin against Great Britain, which stands alone, as Italian Americans and German Americans include many who are uh, fervent political supporters of the fascist regime, regimes in the homeland that are doing so well. 
Um, and there's a lot of concern about subversives in our midst. Jackson is saying a federal prosecutor shouldn't pick out political demons, subversives, um, communities, and target them because you have fears of what they're about. That's where you need to sort of put on the brakes and be a gentleman and begin with predication and only a crime is a basis to commence an investigation or a possible crime, et cetera. Um, he, he's not denying that um, some of what we call predication begins with knowing somebody is a bad guy, uh, a criminal guy. Uh, Al Capone is a big racketeer, bootlegger, murderer, et cetera. And drilling down to see what you can make a case on. Um, but that doesn't start with Al Capone being Italian American or Al Capone being a Republican or Al Capone being, you know, fill in the blank. And, and so I think that's a subtlety that is part of Jackson's speech and is part of the context, even if not fully spoken, that his audience of U.S. attorneys is, is understanding. He's saying to them, don't just gin up these roundup cases uh, because we have political fears and communities, uh, you know, kind of want this. Popularity isn't the right starting point. Your job is to sort of push back on those forces and wait for criminality. And then you've got a lot of power. The federal prosecutor can, you know, crush people. Um, and he's not opposed to using it. But how aggressively you start and in response to what, I think that's what he's really addressing. There's a lot of legal realism there before you kind of had like you before you had kind of the the before legal re realism had a name, frankly. Yeah, right. right? Well, and I mean, so legal realism kind of had its name by then. And Jackson is a, you know, a friend and a colleague of William Douglas and Jerome Frank. Um, you know, he was not a Yale Law School product by any means. Jackson went to Albany Law School for one year and was an apprentice for two other years, never went to a day of college. Fascinating, so, by the way. Fascinating that people used to do that. Reading the law for two years as an apprentice used to be a way that people passed the bar exam. And that's yeah, right. sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, John, but like, no, that's, I that's feel exactly like people right. forget so, that. No, but he, who is he the, who is the last justice who never went to law school? I'm sorry, what? Who is the last justice who never went to law school? Last not appointed or last living? And it depends appointed. how you A last appointed. Right? The last appointed is probably Jackson, uh, who's appointed yeah. in 1941. The last living might be Hugo Black, depending on how you count his legal education. It was quite fragmentary and partial. Um, what Jackson is distinctive in is having not a day of college of no type. He goes right and also And also of being, this being reflected in having a, a writing style that is just totally different from all of his contemporaries. I mean, much more lasting, much more beautiful, much simpler and less laden with, um, with the sort of baggage that you learn in formal writing. Right, right. Well, he, I mean, he wrote, of course, with his pen and it was an age of fountain pen on yellow paper and most of that exists in the Library of Congress. You can see his drafts taking shape, it's fantastic but he wrote with his ear. And I think it's, it's things like high school uh, English teachers. It's memorizing poems and great orations that is really his literary formative experience. And that is the kind of oral skill um, with There's which There's a wrote. rhetoric to Jackson opinions that does not yeah. exist outside. And I wanna ask you a question because it's gonna lead into my kind of like, impolitique question, which is like, could there, my impolitique question, I'll spoil it, is going to be like, could someone have been a Robert Jackson and be a female Supreme Court Justice? Um, in the 1940s or ever? No, 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 not in the 1940s. We, I know, I know not now, but like, I guess my question is like, his writing style was so unusual. And so kind of, I guess, in, like to a certain extent it was beautiful, but it was also a little bit informal. Um, was he, was he, was he thought, would, do people think less of him um, because of his lack of college? They did, was that like a, was, was he, did he basically, did he manage to work his way up despite people kind of trying to cut him down or him being kind of this 
or was he just always kind of like this golden child and like sailed through things? I, I think he succeeded at each rung. And so whatever you thought about his credentials on paper, um, the guy was a fantastic lawyer. And he rose very quickly to sort of leadership positions in city and regional and national bar associations and argued cases before the New York Court of Appeals when it really was, you know, one of the leading courts, maybe the second leading court in the country. Cardozo was the chief judge and so forth. And in all these places, he's dazzling people. Uh, by the time he's on the Supreme Court, I mean, sure, there are people who have um, humble beginnings, but a much fancier pedigree. Harvard Law Professor Felix Frankfurter, uh, who becomes Jackson's best friend, um, is, of course, a, a, you know, a very different kind of resume. Uh, and he used to kind of twit Jackson about Jamestown jurisprudence. Um, you know, the Jackson would kind of from the I wonder pragmatic. if the Jackson Frankfurter friendship is like corollary to the Scalia Ginsburg friendship. No, no, it's not an opposite friendship. It's much more a like-minded, but from sort of two different training perspectives. They're both judicial restraint people. They're both uh, executive power people. They're both also civil liberties people. Uh, they're both they're structuralists. Both we have a congressional form of government. Right. Um, but their styles are different. And, and Frankfurter could be, you know, kind of a peacock and uh, full of himself and a little too erudite and teaching everyone all the time, sometimes to their great frustration. Um, Jackson just found it all kind of charming and they were really very, very tight. Uh, but Frankfurter would say, you know, oh, that must be Jamestown jurisprudence. Didn't learn that at the Harvard Law School. Emphasis Excellent. on the bomb. So, um... Talk to us about the Jackson list. You have been running it now for, it's got to be 15 years. Yeah, um, I think it, yeah, I think it, it is about 15 years. That has a crazy genesis. Uh, in the 1990s. Well, first of all, what is it? The Jackson list is an email list, in effect. Um, people sign up and subscribe. The website is thejacksonlist.com. Uh, and I write a couple of times a month, I've been a little delinquent recently, but the pace is about to pick up, uh, an essay on something that is historical, but usually has a topical hook. It might be connected to a holiday, it might be con connected to a contemporary event. Um, and people from all walks of life, from lawyers and judges to equestrians and farmers and Western New Yorkers and you name it, seem to have found the Jackson list. And then the archive site kind of collects in finished form these essays. Uh, and it has grown and grown and grown till it's about 12,000 direct subscribers and then it gets forwarded by people to everybody on their court or their law firm or et cetera. Um, and so it's, I don't know, it's kind of a magazine. It's kind of a lawfare uh, little brother. Um, it's a newsletter. It's, it's, it's a, a newsletter. I mean, it's fantastic, but it's like a newsletter. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit technologically uh, out of date because it really started as a 1990s listserv. And it really, um, I guess its name comes from something that was once called the Green Bay Packers list. Um, I was on that as a Wisconsin boy. Uh, my friend Jeff Ash ran that for a while and it died a, a death and some of us still miss, miss it. I sent out a Jackson email once to a small group of people and somebody wrote back and said, put me on your Jackson list. And I thought, <laughs> I've got a Jackson list, huh? And so then I, a little while later, sent out another one, probably that original group plus that new person. And, you know, one thing led to another and it became a little bit more formal. It's a lovely list. I've been on it, I want to say, all 15 years. And it's, uh, it's, the it's a great- price of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hardly a price. Uh, so if you have questions about Independent counsels, special counsels, Robert Jackson before or after Nuremberg, during Nuremberg. Uh, this is a good time to pose them. Um, otherwise, Kate and I will just keep going. Um, yeah, and, and we can talk about Nuremberg because that is, of course, you know, like on the global stage, the independent counsel appointment of all independent counsel appointments. I really yeah, would sure. love to talk about Nuremberg because oh, like, yeah. it's fascinating to me, like what he envisioned and after or having come kind of just finishing this huge oversight board, 
kind of project. It's nothing like prosecuting war crimes, obviously, but it is about kind of creating something completely out of whole cloth that had just really not existed before. Um, and um, I've loved and found so moving. And sometimes I, I like just sitting here, I'm getting goosebumps kind of like thinking about kind of remi being reminded of so his like very humble beginnings and then like going to um, kind of just uh, being kind of um, the person delegated to, I don't think this is overstating it, to meet out justice for millions of people who <laughs> like, and um, after, you know, an atrocity that I hope we'll never see the likes of again. And so um, tell us about kind of how different Jackson was during that period, or if he wasn't, tell us what he kind of brought to the, to that, that experience or whether it changed him afterwards. Well, he left trial lawyering really in about 1936. Um, he did a couple of cases when he ran the Revenue Bureau and Treasury, including the Andrew W. Mellon trial, which was a huge national headline trial, and a couple more things when he moved over to DOJ. Then he became an entirely appellate lawyer as Solicitor General, and then he became Attorney General, and then he went on the Supreme Court in 1941. So now four years later, World War II is coming to an end in the European theater, uh, and Roosevelt dies and Truman has a commitment, a Roosevelt Churchill Stalin commitment that the arch criminals whose crimes don't have a particular geographic location will be held accountable by we allies together through a law process. And Truman has to sort of deliver on this. This is the Moscow conference and the Yalta conference, but the plan's not very worked out. And uh, Truman and his circle of immediate advisors, Sam Rosenman, uh, Henry Stimson, John McCloy, most of them were Roosevelt holdovers, um, all say, you know, the best lawyer in the country, the stature that the United States needs to contribute to this is Justice Jackson. Even though he's in a judicial role, it's April, they have a summer recess. It's so crazy that he was in a judicial role at that point, that he like, yeah. sorry, just like kind of Boggles not just a judicial he role. He was on the Supreme Court of. The I House. know it's yeah. not like he was a circuit. He yeah. was like, oh, I'm just gonna take a take a powder. Gonna go <laughs> go to go to Germany. Gonna do this right. thing. <laughs> right. I mean, he was a little frustrated on the court, more than a little frustrated in two ways. Uh, first is that during the war years, it wasn't very relevant to the pressing issues of the time. He was kind of in a backwater. Um, and so early on after Pearl Harbor, he volunteered to Roosevelt, you know, I'm happy to leave the court. You can find some boring judge to take my seat. And if there's something in the executive branch where I can contribute. And Roosevelt basically says, no, you're, you're a law guy. You're not a soldier. You know, George Marshall is now my guy. Um, and so, you know, stay put. And I want you to sort of be on the court. And really what Roosevelt was saying, I intend to make you chief justice. Um, so, you know, Jackson's in the backwater. But Roosevelt says, after the war, there may be something that you're uniquely suited to. And now we're approaching after the war, Roosevelt's no longer on the scene, but you know that's sort of there. Plus during those years on the court, it had become cr quite a fractious place. It had sort of split into two camps. Um, they were all you know, New Deal liberals, but they had very different notions about how one judges. And so there was kind of a black Douglas camp and a Frankfurter Jackson camp. Uh, Frank Murphy was a weaker, but member of the Black and Douglas camp. Uh, and Jackson thought about resigning just because he wasn't that happy on the court before Nuremberg ever came along. And then Nuremberg came along and it was kind of like a trial separation, uh, a summer getaway almost from a place where he wasn't really ex especially happy. Um, so he, in April of 1945, uh, gets asked by the president you know, first a meeting at the court through an emissary, but then at the Oval Office, um, to take on this project on behalf of the United States. And he's told, we're about to win. We're about to capture Hitler. We have an agreement among the allies that we're gonna try him and his inner circle together. The plan has been all worked out through the foreign ministers and the justice ministers and the conferences and so forth. The evidence is all gathered and you have a summer recess. This is kind of a turnkey operation. You can do this during the summer, you might be a little late getting back. Gee, to the did it work out like that, John? <laughs> it didn't quite work out. I mean, literally, this thing turns to crap in Jackson's hand. Um, 
in the three or four days between him saying yes and Truman announcing it publicly. Hitler commits suicide. Um, so does Himmler, so does Goebbels. Um, Borman Everyone is, goes uh, off to Argentina. And like... Borman in absentia. Yeah, they know of Eichmann, but everybody believes he's dead. They've got Hermann Goering and Rudolf Hess, who's been a crazy prisoner in the Tower of London for the war years. And, you know, then sector representatives, but the arch criminals aren't there. Plus there's no worked out international plan court legal system. Plus there's plus, no- Plus they, like they lit all the evidence on fire. Like right. it was just like- so, so Jackson is now kind of holding the booby prize. Yeah, I mean, it's a big prize too, but you know, it's the booby prize and he's got to figure out this job. So it's, it's diplomacy for five months before trial. And then it's the world's first interna international criminal court from November of 45 through the end of the summer of 46. So he misses a whole year at the Supreme Court. And they did function he function as a court of eight. Interesting. And so did they, so when he got back, was it like, how did the trial separation go? Was it kind of like, was it um, kind of like, um, well, we've had some time apart and I've seen some other women and you look very like compared, <laughs> compared the German ladies are like nothing compared to you. <laughs> like the Supreme no Court. German ladies in his uh, Nuremberg experience. Um, he stayed on the court for the rest of his life. He lived for eight more years uh, through Brown versus Board of Education. And then he dies in the fall of 54. Um, and in part because his absence had become so controversial and because the chief justice had died while he was away and then a new chief is appointed and then Jackson airs out some of the bad feeling and issues involving justices Black and Douglas. Uh, he decides to sort of stay and be a justice and just sort of contribute his part to the judicial work. Um, and it's still a divided court and there are big issues, the Cold War issues that Ben was alluding to, um, totalitarianism, communism, U.S. v. Dennis, um, you know, that's the whole time period. And then it's the racial justice NAACP Legal Defense Fund campaign um, that is, uh, you know, Scott versus Payne. Do you think that he would have he would have decided the way he decided on Brown without doing Nuremberg? Or do you think that that influenced him in any some way? Um, I think he was influenced by it, but he was somebody who wanted an honest legal argument for Brown. He would have what? Uh, I'm sorry, you cut out for a second. An honest legal argument for Brown. Um, he didn't think the court's job was to make better policy, and he really wanted Congress to take the lead uh, in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, and you know, a lot of the commerce power, lots of things would allow Congress to do it. But in the end, Chief Justice Warren putting together the court behind an opinion that really doesn't pretend to have much law, that just announces that henceforth in the realm of education, separate but equal is inherently unequal and unconstitutional, um, was a place where Jackson was happy to put down his chips. You know, it, it's not your job to play politics very much as a judge, but every once in a while for the right huge thing, it's a, it's a co-equal branch of government and he was, you know, an enthusiastic part of Brown. I want to ask you about the International Criminal Court, but first, um, Ben is going to introduce uh, someone to ask, that has a question for you. Great. Yeah, so, so uh, Matthew has a question that a lot of people have been asking me recently in a very accusatory fashion uh, uh, because it relates to our current Attorney General. And uh, I'm very interested to see what you think of the what 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 you think the answer to this question is. Uh, so Matthew, the floor is yours. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Kane. Thanks, John. Third time on in lieu of, in, in lieu of fun. So very exciting. But my you question. Do it enough. Yes. To have fun. Yeah. Um, so I also want to hear from uh, Ben and Kate about what their opinion on this. But I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I know you work for the independent counsel Walsh. And I have a quote here from the independent counsel. He said, the pardon of Casper Weinberger and other uh, Iran-Contra defendants undermines the principle that no man is above the law. The Iran-Contra cover-up, which has continued for more than six years, has now been completed with the pardon of Casper Weinberger. So it's related because there's been significant reporting that in the Russian investigation,
investigation, pardons were dangled, which might have which might have helped conceal the truth. So, you know, obviously it would be immensely difficult to change the pardon power because it's in the Constitution. But I was wondering if you could wave a magic wand and you didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, amending the Constitution, the politics that would come with that. Would you change the pardon power so the president could not pardon people in investigations even tangentially related to them? I think my answer is no. I haven't reached a bottom line. Um, I was a prosecutor on the Weinberger case. I worked in the Walsh office at the time of those pardons. Um, we were two weeks from trial and President Bush was about to leave office and the defense attorneys had given notice to the court that they intended to subpoena Bush as a former president to testify as a defense witness in the case. Um, and so the trial would have gotten into you know, many things, obviously focused on the charges against Secretary Weinberger, but Bush knowledge and role in those arms deals, et cetera, um, would have been part of the trial and maybe he would have been a witness. Um, and he, with the pardon power, negated that possibility. That's what independent counsel Walsh is talking about with that quotation you read. Um, but I think the pardon power is an important check on the legislative branch and an important check on the judicial system. Um, yes, the presidency does have various other powers, but they're mostly subsidiary implementation. They have a very, very great amount of discretion and very high stakes consequences. But there are very few people, very few places where a president can be the initiator of a fundamental constitutional change of course. Um, the pardon power is one of those, like the veto power, if not overridden, a couple of others. Um, and I think that it still is politically accountable. It frankly made more sense before we had a 22nd Amendment, when a president always had the prospect, at least, of fa facing the voters again. And so when you have somebody who is a second term lame duck, um, then the pardon power maybe is a very great power. Uh, Bush had been defeated. Uh, and was only a one-term president, uh, but you know, political accountability and the potential of congressional oversight is there. I do think uh, pardons in some way have to be legally accountable if they are provably corrupt. For example, selling pardons, I don't think is a lawful exercise of an Article II power. I think it would be a federal crime and a nugatory event. Um, you know, we've never seen uh, cash on the barrel uh, pardon selling in the national government. We've seen that in state governments in various ways. Um, but I think that uh, the political motive, the political interest, the political benefit is sort of baked into the design of checks and balances. Congress has a lot of things that are political powers and political benefits. So does the judiciary. Um, this one, I think, is there as part of a machine that interacts with those powers and belongs to the president. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't love it in 1992. I don't love it in particular contexts where it might be dangled or it might be a distortion on fact finding or public accountability. Uh, but constitutionally, I think it's, it's, it's a permanent part of our design and it's okay. So I wanna ask, I wanna follow up on a different aspect of the same question, which is that a whole lot of people over the last couple of years last year, have pointed to Bill Barr's role in these latter stage uh, Iran-Contra pardons, um, which he recommended and, and pushed uh, on the president um, as evidence that he was always the cover-up artist and you know the role that he is playing now with respect to first Mueller and then the uh, subsequent uh, matters is really of a piece with the role that he played back then. My view of those pardons until relatively recently has been a little bit gentler, which is, you know, the Walsh investigation had gone on for seven years. Um, it was to uh, a lot of Republicans, what the Starr investigation later became to a lot of Democrats, the sort of portrait of the investigation that is out of control. 
I always thought that there were aspects, like both of those caricatures were caricatures, but it was the way a lot of people really felt and that there was something to be said, although uh, in somewhat the same way as there was something to be said for Clinton to pardon Susan McDougall, right? And sort of end the thing after seven years to say, okay, whatever the merits of these things, it's time to move on. And I wouldn't have urged them myself, but I've never really looked at it as a cover up so much as a foot stomp, okay, this needs to end sometime. And I guess my question is, how do you understand it in retrospect as somebody who worked on the prosecutorial side uh, and specifically, how do you understand Bill Barr's role in it, or more precisely, before his current action? So if you were, when you, when you heard that Bill Barr was being nominated to be attorney general, and you didn't know what he was going to do with Mueller, and you didn't know what he was going to do with John Durham and Michael Flynn and all of that, all you knew is that he had done played that role in, in 1992. How did you understand that role then? Um, at, did you understand it as corrupt? Or did you understand it as a, a sort of statement about finality? Yeah, I, I did not view it as uh, cover-up behavior by Attorney General Barr in 1992. Uh, I've never met him and didn't deal with him, obviously, in 1992 or ever. Uh, but I think he was behaving ideologically and didn't know very much about Iran-Contra. He just had the team belief that it was awful, that it had you know, no point in continuing, that uh, the Weinberger superseding indictment that the court had directed by the end of October 1992 had somehow caused Bush to lose the election, that they just hated it and they were going to kill it. Um, and I think that that was bad behavior. I think he should have you know, informed himself. I think he certainly should have had contact with and meetings with Walsh. He should have you know, delegated that to people to sort of find out what these cases are. The head of the operations director to the CIA had just been convicted. Uh, two remaining cases uh, were slated to be tried in early 1993. Um, Walsh had announced that no further indictments were expected, but you know, what, what was at stake in these cases was something that Barr could have learned and then might still have ended up in the same place, but he never bothered to learn. He sort of stayed mm -hmm. at the talk radio level of right-wing hatred of Walsh, which side comment is so deeply ironic because Judge Walsh was a lifelong Republican. He had been deputy attorney general in, in the Eisenhower administration. Uh, before that, he had been a federal judge appointed by Eisenhower. Um, other top deputies in his office were Republicans. But the place did not have politics. The place had law enforcement, uh, maybe too much power, and that gets back to the Morrison issues. But it was not playing politics. Um, mm -hmm. But Barr, and Barr really, although Attorney General, Barr is second to the White House counsel, Boyden Gray, hated Walsh, hated the Iran-Contra investigation. I think their client, President Bush, hated it too. And the facts didn't matter. This was just Article Two time, and Christmas Eve was a perfect moment to finish this off. Um, now, jumping to the present time period, um, I guess I was one of those gullible people because I said publicly um, that uh, Barr was an institutionalist and would be a good successor to Jeff Sessions and had experience and would be a stabilizing force. I kind of assumed, hoped, but didn't have a basis uh, at the time and turned out, I think, to be wrong that he'd grown up a lot since 1992. And that a lot of people thought that, John. Like a that lot of people. Did, yeah. As people yeah. remind me daily on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I was in that camp, and um, I was I was incorrect. I've, I've I've eaten that humble pie. Yeah, me too. The um, I we have to wrap up, but I wanted to to not to like flip around too much. But I'm just really curious. I took this wonderful class on the International Criminal Court with Julie Sullivan when I was in law school, and it, like the lessons from it. Where, to be clear, was she was one of the federal, she was one of the, she was a federal prosecutor, but she's also one of the, I think she was like a named prosecutor at some point for like, for the ICC. Um, and so she taught this amazing class um, 
and we learned all about kind of, well, first, of course, we learned about Nuremberg and then we read, it was a really happy class is really what you should know. It's like all about genocide and then, and then putting genocide on trial in a completely war-torn um, and totally like infrastructureless uh, uh, type of like environment. Um, but I came away um, from that class and like the survey of Bosnia, the Rwanda and um, Nuremberg as being kind of like this slow, like th that like for the for the world imposing kind of a western sense of like adv like like of justice in places like Rwanda following their genocide were not like necessarily the best means of like actually achieving fairness and justice even though they were like very necessary in a, in a situation like Nuremberg or Bosnia. Um, and I'm kind of like, and so that was just my, I mean, and most of that was because the system in Rwanda was corrupt. People kind of use the system in Rwanda, like people like took advantage of it. they were bad actors. And because they had their own system of justice that did not resemble like a kind of a, like a traditional Western kind of system of justice or due process that we have. Um, but I'm curious, like what, you, if you know, and if you don't, that's fine. But like, what what Jackson kind of would have thought about like what the ICC has become? Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, the predicate to criminal law enforcement is political power and will. You know, there's not a DA until there is a legal system, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's not, you know. So the predicate is, of course, peace. You know, the war situation has to end, and then some power that controls the situation has to have the decision, the values, the priorities to take a legal path. Um, back in 1945, the real choice, three choices, I guess, were to sort of do summary justice, line up a bunch of Nazis and shoot them. Uh, and that could be dozens, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands. Another alternative at the other extreme would be to kind of just say war is what countries do and the West won this one. And now we control what used to be Germany and we'll take its industrial infrastructure and, you know, et cetera. And the third was to kind of bring a law perspective to this and try and sort of thread the needle between those other two alternatives. That's what Nuremberg was, but it was so statistically partial. I mean, all told there are 13 Nuremberg trials, less than 300 Nazi war criminals are prosecuted. Um, you know, the culpable and criminally worthy of prosecution numbers, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps, or at least in the tens of thousands, high tens of thousands. Um, what really brought, you know, sort of peace and accountability and progress to Germany and sort of prevented a third world war was the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. was the Federal Republic of Germany, was the economic miracle, was trade relations, was a large U.S. military presence in Germany for decades. You know, all of those are factors that turned Germany into, you know, I don't know if I'll get there again soon, but, you know, wonderful Germany. Um, you know, Rwanda is a, an example of something that in this moment of consensus, Rwanda and Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union is gone, the Berlin Wall is gone, and atrocities are highly visible is something where a consensus in the international community says, bring law to bear on this. But it's it's one tool and not a huge tool and not the permanently um, magical tool to solve these situations. That's a really wonderful, like that's a, you just put this in so much context and kind of like, yeah, like, and like kind of like, yeah, we, that was very, that was super useful to kind of like changing my mindset about like thinking about the history of these things. I think I was like, you know, seeing a little bit as so, like- so um, the Jackson part, just to- Oh yeah, sure. Um, he was skeptical about codification projects because he thought it would be just much too easy to kind of create new international conventions that would be sort of signed by the same old people and be the same old vaporous commitments that didn't deliver anything on the ground. Um, and so he did not think Nuremberg was a one-off, never to be repeated. Uh, but he was not particularly interested in drafting committees of lawyers um, thinking academically about an international court when on the ground what the world was dealing with was a Cold War and the Soviet bloc and economic catastrophe in the late 1940s. Um, law needs peace, needs power, needs resources, needs consensus. 
So you think he'd be happy with the fact that there's only been like an, a few prosecutions? No, I, I I don't play the Ouija board game, and it's oh it's, sorry, yeah, it's really it's really hard to guess what he'd think. Um, but the Yugoslavia tribunal is a success story. The Rwanda tribunal is a success story. Um, some of the hybrids, Sierra Leone, um, Cambodia, for all of its fits and starts, have accomplished tangible things. Um, so. Jackson would be an admirer of each of those. He would kind of view each of those people as, you know, like suckers who should have learned from his experience, but they kind of got caught with the, the booby prize and they made a success out of it, just like he did. So I think he would be admiring of all of that. So uh, what is your favorite Robert Jackson opinion? Uh, his first, I think. You, uh, it's called uh, Edwards. It's about the Okies uh, traveling to California. It's a right to travel case. And Jackson is new and not, I mean, you said he had an unorthodox writing style. He got more conventional as the years went on. But in that first case, he writes a concurring opinion that is just a straight constitutional sensibility about the interstate right to travel. Mm. And about I love the right to travel. I wish we all talked about it more often. Maybe we will now, honestly, yeah. so. so he, Kind of without acknowledging that there is a slaughterhouse cases decision or doctrinal complexity just says you know privileges and immunities of national citizenship have to mean you can load up the wagon and head to california <laughs> when you're dying in the dust bowl of oklahoma uh, i also I, like i i, I, love, I, hate, that I, I love that he hung it i forgot that i have i do remember reading this case he hung on privilege privileges and immunities right yeah. it wasn't yeah. in his concurring opinion the court's opinion doesn't sort of pin it on that but he does do you have a favorite robert jackson opinion kate no i don't think so like i'm not like i'm like not as much a like i forget I, i'm terrible at or remembering he cases. dissented in korematsu that is a oh yes yeah, so the dissent in korematsu is like amazing i guess like uh, i guess when i think of my, like my favorite jackson opinion is also a dissent but it is not the dissent in korematsu what is it, is it? the dissent in terminiello v chicago okay from, which is mostly famous for having coined the phrase, being the original uh, place where he warns against turning the Bill of Rights into a suicide pact. But I admire it for its ferocious defense of the authority of democratic societies to police totalitarian movements. And I think it is it is the point on which he is arguing, and it's a, a dissent from a Douglas free speech opinion is unimportant actually, but the defense of the authority of democratic societies, I think is one of his great uh, contributions. And it is a post Nuremberg opinion that actually quotes Goebbels. Um, and I think it's, it's one of his truly brilliant pieces of writing and so to all people still listening at seven minutes past our closing time, your homework assignment tonight is to read the uh, Jackson dissent in Terminiello v. Chicago. Um, I also would like to make a recommendation of something I just- um, And Edwards. Yes, and Edwards. Edwards. I'm gonna go read both of those, but I was gonna say that, and this has nothing to do with Jackson or anything else. It's just a really great historical, since we've been talking so much about history, uh, I just watched the Apollo 11 documentary that is based completely and entirely not on any interviews, but just piece and no narration, nothing. It's just pieces of, um, of historical footage and it's kind of color corrected. So I think more than anything that I've ever watched that's like historically documented by video that like people don't, people look like they're in shoot Like it looks like someone shot Mad Men and like, and they're wearing costumes because like the quality is that good in the like in the, th so it's just that like, it kind of flips your mind about it feeling old timey or like historical and kind of like really makes it very, very real in like this interesting way. Um, but I would highly recommend that. And it's like a lot, less, it's better. It's a little bit more uplifting than Nuremberg if you were gonna watch a movie <laughs> after. <laughs> I've seen it and I endorse that one. All right, um, we are gonna leave it there. John Barrett, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys, I it's a blast. I designate Nate to give the final word. 
Nate, what's on your mind? Final word is yours. Oh, okay, okay, take two, here we go again. Um, it is a dark and stormy day, but once again, your words and conversation illuminate and provide light to this afternoon, and I hope I see you all do that again in the near future. Uh, we, uh, Jackson, well, Jackson couldn't have written it better himself. Well done, where is it a dark and stormy day? It is Central Alabama. Central Alabama, well, to Central Alabama, what do we say, Kate? Uh, oh God, if you can't have fun, uh, in lieu of fun, come hang out with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.